So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure to have you here, but also, of course, we are super happy to have a lecturer in the Nobel Prize winner of chemistry this year. Uh, we are especially happy that it's actually Professor Thomas Lindahl, the Swedish Nobel laureate, who will visit us and present his work. It hasn't happened since 1948 that the Chemistry Prize has gone to a Swedish person, so we are very, very pleased with that. Thank you, Thomas, for coming here. My name is Jonas Bergqvist. I'm professor at analytical chemistry and neurochemistry here at Uppsala University, but I'm also chairman of the Swedish, oh no, sorry, the Uppsala Chemical Society. And we have a tradition in Uppsala that we, this, every, this time every year, hand out a prize. Maybe not as prestigious as the prize we hand out in Stockholm, but this is the tax-free prize, actually. So uh, we have the great pleasure to ask Professor Lindahl to have, help me now to hand over the prize to the best student in chemistry. So can I have the next slide, please? And this year, the prize has gone to Ben Johnson. I think some of you know Ben Johnson from athletics, but this is actually a, a, an athletic in chemistry we are going to meet. So please, Ben. You are somewhere in the audience. Please come up on the stage and bring your supervisor, Dr. Sasha Ott, who is also here today. So from Professor Lindahl, Ben Johnson gets a diploma, but we also will hand over some money, actually. <laughs> and I have the money here. Please. I'll pocket it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, Sasha. Thank you. So, thank you, Professor Lindahl, for that honor. I now asked and invited uh, Professor Ulf Pettersson, who is here in the audience somewhere. There he is, yes. Professor Ulf Pettersson has uh, worked together with Thomas and will also tell us a bit about the background in, in, in Thomas' work. So please. Well, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure when the Swede wins the Nobel Prize, and it's a very great pleasure to be a friend of a Nobel Prize winner. Um, Thomas was born in Stockholm and um, studied uh, in schools in Stockholm and inter interestingly he for a while failed in chemistry. But uh, he also had a very inspiring uh, chemistry teacher in another school which I think made up for this loss. He decided to study medicine and uh, at the Karolinska Institute. He became interested in research and decided quite early on that uh, clinical medicine was not really uh, his business. Um, he started to work with a not so well-known Swede today, Einar Hammerstein. I think I looked in Wikipedia and I think there are only two lines about him, but he made some very fundamental discoveries. He was the first person who showed that DNA is a macromolecule. Before his studies, everybody thought it was a, it was a tet tetrameric structure of the four nucleotides. Um, this was very important and I think put Thomas on the right track. After his dissertation, he went to Princeton, got a fellowship and studied with um, Jack Schack, uh, Fresco. Uh, a nucleic acid chemist, and they did some early work on the stability of, of nucleic acids. Um, from Princeton, Thomas moved to Rockefeller and um, was in the Edelman department for a while, but um, decided quite soon thereafter to go back to Sweden and become a faculty member of the Karolinska Institute, um, where he went in 1969. Uh, working at um, George Klein's famous um, Tumor Biology Institute. His topic then was um, very much focused on, on viruses, and that's where our research overlapped and we became friends. Um, 
in this area, Thomas made some very remarkable discoveries. He showed that the Epstein-Barr virus, a tumor-causing virus, existed as an episome um, inside the, the cancer cells, and this was the first time that this was um, demonstrated. Soon thereafter, Thomas left for Gothenburg and became a professor of medical chemistry in the medical faculty and served there between 78 and 1982. Then he was recruited to, um, to London uh, to become the um, head of the um, uh, mutagenesis labor laboratory um, at um, the Imperial, Imperial Cancer Research Fund laboratory in Mill Hill. Um, and shortly thereafter, he became the director of, of this um, uh, institute. Uh, today, um, Thomas is an emeritus group leader um, at the Francis Crick Institute um, and also an emeritus director of Cancer Research UK uh, with the uh, Clare Hall Laboratory in London. The rest of Thomas' career is a logic uh, continuation of his very important observation that DNA is, is a very fragile molecule under its physiological um, conditions and needs constant repair. His laboratory has ident identified, isolated and characterized dozens of the molecules which are involved in this life-supporting um, mechanism. I think looking at um, Thomas's um, publication uh, uh, list, I think, makes um, any scientist quite envious. It's such a number of important discoveries and contributions to this very central theme of life sciences. Thomas, it's nice to give you the floor. We are looking forward to your lecture. I don't think I need it, I'm all by them. Good morning. On the way to the lecture here, Hall, I was uh, slightly taken aback because I was asked, was I going to give my lecture in English or Swedish? Eh? And uh, I thought I would say something in Swedish eh, first but give my lecture in English. Eh? So det är ett nöje att vara tillbaka i Uppsala. Jag har fått många fina inflytanden här i Uppsala och jag kom hit regelbundet i flera år. The reason I used to come to Uppsala was that when molecular biology was a new science 40, 50 years ago, the best scientists in the topic uh, in Stockholm and Uppsala got together. Huh? There were uh, people like uh, Lennart Philipsson, Hans Boman, Peter Reichert, and Joe Bertani. Uh, and uh, I was a junior member of that group. Huh? And we had joint seminars. Uh, so uh, the people in Stockholm travel to Uppsala every second month, and the people in Uppsala travel to Stockholm every second month. Uh, and uh, that, over the years, made for some excellent contacts. Uh, so I feel I'm partly educated in Uppsala. Uh, with regard to my lecture now, uh, First, I thought I would try to talk a little bit about my most recent work, which uh, involves the influence of DNA repair and DNA processing alterations on human autoimmunity. But uh, I ran out of time. And uh, so what you will hear now is more or less a similar lecture uh, or very similar lecture to what I had prepared for the Nobel Foundation in Stockholm. Uh, so I will start out with that. And the topic of my lecture is uh, the intrinsic fragility of DNA. All micromolecules are to some extent unstable. 
Uh, my own work has focused on this inherent liability of DNA itself. In my early career as a postdoc at Princeton University in the 1960s, we investigated heat-induced shape changes and unfolding of the macromolecular structure of purified transfer RNA, uh, the small RNA molecules that are key components in protein synthesis. In these time-consuming experiments, I was surprised to observe that my purified tRNA not only unfolded at elevated temperatures, uh, which was known, uh, but also very slowly decomposed in an irreversible way. I was advised by colleagues that human fingers often have substantial amounts of ribonuclease on their surface, that is the enzyme that degrades RNA, and that the problem might disappear if I improved my laboratory technique. Uh, but that was not the problem. I observed that different preparations of tRNA obtained by different methods still retain their property of apparently unprovoked slow decomposition in the same way. I extended this work to show that the decomposition of tRNA involved destruction of individual base residues and also involved slow cleavage of the phosphodiester bonds that link the RNA nucleotide building blocks together. I even published a short report on the heat-induced decomposition, decomposition of tRNA that nobody found particularly interesting. Uh, so I moved on to ad, another laboratory for experiment, experimental work on ligation and processing of strand bricks in DNA by previously unknown mammalian enzymes such as DNA ligases and DNA exonucleases. But I had not forgotten the puzzling spontaneous decomposition of tRNA. So when I moved back to Sweden, eh, and obtained my own research group in Stockholm a couple of years later, I wanted to investigate if DNA, like tRNA, was susceptible to slow, spontaneous decomposition. This was a rather far-fetched idea, because DNA, as the carrier of genetic information in our cells, was believed to be very stable in the intracellular environment. 50 years ago, 60 years ago, people even thought there must be new laws of physics uh, that account for the fact that the genetic material just didn't seem to deteriorate at all. It could continue carrying genetic information from generation to the next generation. So what about the liability of DNA in order to support such non-conventional work? I did not apply for a research grant, which may well not have been funded, uh, but used some Swedish funds I had already been awarded to study enzymatic processing of DNA strand breaks in mammalian cells. Uh, the initial strategy was to perform some pilot experiments on DNA instability, and if the results did not seem promising, quietly bury the project. But it turned out that although DNA was considerably more stable than RNA, it still underwent very slow but relevant decomposition in neutral aqueous buffers. Uh, I then devised a series of time-consuming experiments to attempt to quantitate and characterize the very slow degradation of DNA solutions under physiological conditions. This meant investigating the stability of DNA at different pH values, not too dramatically removed from neutral pH, at various elevated temperatures, and at different ionic strengths and levels of charge neutralization. In order to facilitate our analysis, most studies were performed with DNA radioactively labeled in individual base residues. Such DNA can be prepared from various bacterial mutant strains with defects in synthesis of precursors of DNA, 
grown in the presence of commercially obtained radioactive base residues. Aliquots of such DNA solutions were incubated for several days and then analyzed by chromatography. The most conspicuous change was that small amounts of base residues were lost from the DNA. In particular, the purine bases guanine and adenine. So I'll have the next slide, please. Our first slide. So this is DNA, and it looks like a very stable molecule, but our, the DNA in our cells is not made from such durable material. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, this is a section of a strand of the DNA. It's a double helical molecule. Only one strand is shown here with the four bases. Uh, and I put in little arrows here at the sites where we found that DNA, were actually, DNA was actually decomposing. And you see immediately that there are several sites that are susceptible to degradation for different reasons, which are listed to the left. Hydrolytic attack, oxidative damage, and damage by small molecules in the cells, such as an uh, uh, enzyme cofactor. So, next slide shows a uh, little more in detail these changes. Uh, and uh, here is uh, one good example. This is the base cytosine in DNA, and it's susceptible to deamination. Eh? You can see in the middle of the uh, slide, it says hydrolytic attack. And that's how DNA can be deaminated from uh, cytosine to uracil. The base, cytosine, the base uracil does not occur regularly in DNA, most likely because you can't have a situation where one of the bases in DNA easily can be decomposing to another base with a different specificity. So what nature does instead, it methylates this residue to thymine. So in DNA, we have thymine or cytosine, but not uracil. The cleavage of base sugar bonds uh, uh, results in loss of information and formation of an abasic site in DNA. Can we backtrack one slide? Yeah. So this is perhaps the major change in DNA, depurination. Eh? Loss of guanine and adenine. Eh? Uh, and of course, uh, this abiotic salt leads to loss of genetic information. The base is no longer there. Uh, another point of interest is that the uh, basic sites generated by loss of adenine and guanine are chemically identical, and they occur at about the same frequency. And that means that uh, to know the identity of a missing base, you have to consult the information in the opposite strand of the DNA molecule. And in addition to depurination, then, uh, there are other changes in DNA. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the most important of those is this deamination of cytosine. And next slide, please. This leads to a change in coding specificity. So cytosine to the left base pairs with guanine in the Watson Creek double helix while uracil would be pair with adenine, so you have an erroneous base pair here. So you have to do something about this, otherwise you have a mutation. And next slide, please. When we quantitated all these losses of changes of information in DNA, the numbers turned out to be surprisingly high. In a mammalian cell, there are 10 to 20,000 changes in the DNA bases per cell and per day. 
and that is for double-stranded DNA, there is some protection of some basis by the double helical structure of DNA. While uh, double-stranded and single-stranded DNA are depurinated at similar rates, uh, single-stranded DNA is 150 times more susceptible than double-stranded DNA to deamination of cytosine and also 5-methylcytosine. Uh, this means that in a transcriptionally active replicating cells where the DNA opens up to a small extent, uh, there are about 300 potentially mutagenic cytosine residues uh, generated per day, per cell. This decay of the cellular DNA would lead to an unacceptable deleterious loss and alterations of genetic information. The answer to this dilemma must be that there is a correction mechanism. Uh, next slide, please. So this is one of our main conclusions, that there must be something that corrects DNA damage, and that is DNA repair. Next slide, please. In search for such mechanisms, we established that abasic sites can be removed and replaced by an excision repair mechanism. You might see, if you have sharp eyes on top of the slide, that there is a missing base in the top strand to the left. And that site, which no longer has a base, is susceptible to a special endonuclease, so-called AP endonuclease, uh, which will cleave the DNA backbone at that site. After DNA cleavage at that site, there's another enzyme function that takes out the remnant of the base, which is an informationless sugar phosphate residue. And then you have a small gap in the DNA, a gap of usually just one nucleotide. And then a DNA polymerase fills in this gap, and finally a DNA ligase joins the DNA chain together again. So this is an excision repair mechanism. And this same general excision repair strategy is used for other types of DNA lesions. Uh, such as DNA damage induced by ultraviolet light uh, or uh, replication errors. And those two problems have been investigated by my co winners to this price, uh, Dr. Ansi Sanyar and Dr. Paul Modric. Uh, if the DNA contains an altered base, such as a uracil, which may be a deaminated cytosan, I found a previously unknown DNA repair enzyme uh, which is employed for this problem, a DNA glycosylase. That is a, an enzyme that doesn't cleave phosphodiester bonds in DNA, which is what nucleases do, but this type of enzyme cleaves a base sugar bond in DNA. Uh, once we knew that, we could purify this enzyme and we could also reconstitute the base excision repair pathway with purified enzymes. Uh, first with bacterial enzymes and then with human enzymes. Next slide, please. So this is shown to the left here. This is the strategy with the enzymes I've already mentioned. And uh, this is a data slide where we have used uh, synthetic uh, uh, small piece of DNA, an oligonucleotide with a complementary strand, uh, which can be analyzed by gel electrophoresis and visualized this way. And uh, what happens here is that you can, in a stepwise, reconstitute reaction. So if you first add the DNA glycosylase, there is no chain break in GNA, so you don't see any difference here. Yeah? Uh, 
but the, that site has now become susceptible to the next enzyme in the pathway, which is the AP endonuclease, and the chain gets cleaved there. So you can see it has half the size here from uh, the actual oligonucleotides are shown at the bottom. We start with one that's 41 nucleotides long. It gets cleaved until a length of 21, and then uh, uh, after some trimming of the end, and filling in by DNA polymerase. We are back up in the top right corner to the DNA piece of its correct length again. But now with the uracil removed. So this is the strategy that's uh, used to remove many DNA lesions. Huh? And models for aspects of this pathway have been proposed by several groups, including us. Uh, next slide, please. It is not a simple task for a DNA glycosylase to find a single uracil base in a large excess of DNA with very similar bases, uh, such as thymine and, and uh, cytosine. Uh. So the repair enzyme scans the DNA it travels along the DNA molecule uh, until it finds an alteration. Uh, and when it finds an alteration, it usually flips out the base uh, so that it can be looked at more carefully. And if the base is uh, damage residue like uracil, it is cleaved then by cleaving the base sugar bond. No chain break, just removing the base. But this then initiates this DNA repair process. So this is what has been called base excision repair. So far, I've discussed how repair enzymes can restore damaged DNA. But occasionally, an organism can also use induced changes in the DNA structure to generate helpful genetic diversity. Well, evolution is helpful. Crocodiles evolve rather slowly, and they are not as smart as we are. Uh, but uh, there are other more acute reasons, even within ourselves, where DNA repair is important to generate genetic diversity. And the striking case is the efficient diversification of antibodies. In order to improve the repertoire of antibodies, uh, an antibody-producing cell can have the ability to actively change the structure of genes encoding antibodies by targeted deamination of cytosine in DNA. Next slide, please. So this is an antibody scheme to the left with the light, light and heavy chains uh, that uh, together form the antibody. And at the end terminal end of the antibody, there is a substantial sequence variation, eh? uh, which accounts for the versatility of antibodies. Eh? And uh, the idea that you actually have such processing of DNA with a couple of enzymes eh, to generate antibodies eh, it was due to the brilliant insight of the late Michael Neuberger in Cambridge, UK, a friend of mine and a collaborator who unfortunately died last year. And I had the pleasure to collaborate with his group. Uh, the proposed reaction is that one specific diaminase, AID, which was discovered by Honjo, uh, causes targeted deamination of antibody genes. And uh, uracil DNA glycosylase, which I've already described, is then employed to process uh, this DNA and triggers local muta mutational changes, uh, which are reflected in an expanded and more efficient antibody response. There are several twists to this story, which I won't have time to go into here. But uh, these are the two key players to the right here, if you want a large repertoire of new antibodies in your cells. And so far, 
I've talked about hydrolytic DNA damage caused by water, but there are other types of DNA damage uh, caused by reactive oxygen, the oxygen we breathe and metabolize. Next slide, please. One particularly sinister form of such DNA damage is the oxidation of guanine residues in DNA to 8-oxo-G or 8-hydroxoguanine. Uh, this is a miscoding base. And uh, fortunately, this lesion is excised by a specific DNA glycosylase, which is different from the enzyme that removes uracil from DNA. And there are also other endogenous agents in cells than water and oxygen that can cause DNA damage. Next slide. Uh, well, this is a follow-up on the 8-oxo-G story, showing some more details on what happens there. And next slide, please. In cells, in addition then to water and uh, reactive oxygen, there are several reactive small molecules. Uh, and it turns out some of them can also react with DNA and cause alterations in the DNA structure, which are usually damaging changes. Uh, one example, an important one, which we have uh, found and uh, investigated, is uh, damage caused by the reactive coenzyme s methionine. Uh, this is the coin in methyl transfer reactions in, in the chain, in the cell. Uh, and uh, you can see the methyl group in the middle of the structure attached to a sulfur, and that methyl group is easily donated. Uh, so it's an efficient coenzyme because it's easy to mobilize that methyl group. Uh, the side effect of that is that it can even react without an enzyme with uh, macromolecules like DNA, RNA, protein, and donate its methyl group to some site where it doesn't belong. And then you have, again, a form of DNA damage which the cell has to do something about. Next slide, please. So this, this is shown to the left. Uh, uh, this is uh, the reaction when you have to deal with a methyl group. Here is an adenine residue has been methylated to 3-methyladenine. And 3-methyladenine is a base that sticks out in the minor groove of the DNA helix. Uh, there are usually never any methyl groups in the minor groove of the DNA helix. You can't have them there because the polymerases, RNA polymerase and DNA polymerase, travel in this minor groove. And if there's a methyl group sticking out there, it's a blocking lesion. So it's a really a lethal lesion. Eh? You prevent the polymerasing enzymes from traveling on the DNA. So the, and the way to deal with this lesion is to the left is quite analogous to the procedure for removing uracil from DNA. You have a specific DNA glycosylase, which in this case, case specializes in removing 3-methyladenine from DNA. And then we have base excision repair with an AP endonuclease, a DNA polymerase, and a DNA ligase, together restoring the DNA structure. But since there are a variety of different alkylation lesions, or methylation lesions like this, uh, in each case, uh, this poses a new problem during evolution. The cell doesn't know that you use the same strategy to do something else. That's just a problem has cropped up. And uh, to the delight of biochemists, uh, sometimes uh, this has been sorted out by inventing a new, DNA, a new kind of DNA repair mechanism that people didn't know about. So here's a rather exotic repair mechanism to shown in the middle slide. This is a very mutagenic DNA lesion, O6-methylguanine. Uh, 
and that causes to go on into miscode. So it's a quite na nasty, dangerous lesion, and it has to be inactivated quickly. And the way the cell does this is to move the methyl group away from the DNA. And, uh, and the enzyme just grabs the methyl group and transfers it to itself. Then there is a new problem because it turns out this generates a methylcysteine site in the repair enzyme. The DNA is now fine again, but you have a repair enzyme with a methylcysteine in it. And this happens to be a very stable co uh, chemical compound. You can boil methylcysteine in hydrochloric acid for long times, and it still doesn't decompose. So, so it wouldn't be easy to cleave that uh, particular lesion. Eh? You'd have to use free radical chemistry or something exotic like that. Uh, so what the cell does instead, uh, say, is that energy comes cheap, and we'll just make a new repair enzyme. So to repair this lesion, the cell doesn't uh, bother to uh, uh, try to generate, regenerate it. You just sacrifice, sacrifice the whole enzyme molecule for each lesion you uh, repair this way. And the people who are interested in nomenclature then get very excited about the question, should one call this uh, an enzyme when it doesn't turn over? We think of it as an enzyme that to undergo suicide uh, inactivation. Some commercially made effective enzyme inhibitors work like this. They will act on their substrate, but uh, then the substrate or the substrate product is stuck to the enzyme and can't be removed any longer, and you have killed the enzyme that way. So this is a case of this a rather unique case when it occurs in nature. And uh, I think of it, uh, you know, you have lights on here or lights on uh, at home and so on. Energy this way can come rather cheaply and uh, you can afford to sacrifice an enzyme molecule every time you repair this kind of lesion. More recently, we found another type of DNA repair enzyme, again acting on alkylated or methylated DNA and it can remove methyl groups from the toxic residues, one methyladenin and three methylcytosin in DNA. And again, we have a problem that these are blocking lesions uh, that uh, are lethal. So we know there must be some way of dealing with lesions like one methyladenin DNA. Next slide, please. But it took us, uh, it was shown briefly on the other slide, but here it's in more detail. It took us many years to find this enzyme because it has rather exotic cofactors. Uh, it turns out that uh, it requires as cofactors iron, but also the small coenzyme alpha ketoglutarate or oxoglutarate. And when we as biochemists try to reconstitute uh, repair reactions in, in, uh, in vitro, we can make a substrate, and we can uh, you make a cell extract that contains active enzymes. But if you don't know what the cofactor is, uh, it can be quite difficult to find an enzyme that has an exotic cofactor if you don't, haven't added that to your reaction mix. Uh. And uh, finally, we were helped by bioinformatics that perhaps there was some clue that we had this odd cofactor requirement. And uh, once we had thought about it, uh, uh, suddenly all our experiments started working. Yeah? As long as we had the right cofactors in the test tube, uh, which is not surprising afterwards, but then you don't know what the cofactors is, it was a great relief when we could do that experiment. Yeah? And it turns out that this unexpected demethylation reaction with DNA using these cofactors also is mimicked in demethylation of histones. Again, you require iron and alpha ketoglutarate for that. Uh, uh, this is a reaction which is important for regulation of cell growth. 
And uh, once we had established this reaction, the people who studied histone demethylation started using the same experimental conditions and they could do their experiments. Uh, uh, so they were meaningful. So in conclusion then, there are several common molecules in cells, like s methionine. Others are formaldehyde. Uh, they can damage DNA, and they are impossible to avoid because some of these also include water. Uh, next slide, please. This summarizes some of the things in cells uh, that can damage DNA. And uh, water is a quite weak group-specific reagent, uh, but it's not unreactive. Uh? And it's present in a very high concentration in cells. And it would be difficult to try to devise some way of avoiding it. So if it reacts with DNA, you have to repair your DNA sins. And there are other, as I mentioned, other small molecules that react with DNA, many of them generated in metabolism. And I believe that all of those have not been found as yet. So there are probably other things in cells that damage DNA. Huh? And if you don't look for them, you won't find them. Huh? So I would predict that there are more DNA repair enzymes waiting to be discovered. We first have to find out what kind of endogenous DNA damage happens in cells. And we don't know everything about this yet. Uh, but the fact that what, what <coughs> sorry, that water is a damaging agent for tissue components has been known for 400 years, uh, because William Shakespeare points this out. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the graveyard scene in Hamlet, in which Hamlet uh, uh, shows himself to be an excellent scientist. Uh, he asks a series of logical and penetrating questions. So it's a very good lesson for a student to read the graveyard scene in Hamlet. Eh? That tells you how to ask good scientific questions. And uh, what Hamlet says here is, how long will a man lie in the earth before he rots? And the grave digger answers, in faith, he will last you some eight year or nine year. A tanner will last you nine year. Why he more than another? Why, sir? His hide is so tanned with his trade. A tanner works on curing leather, like preparing leather for shoes. His hide is so tanned with his trade that he will keep out water to a great while. And your water is a sore decayer of your wretched dead body. So they know it all. And after this scene, uh, Hamlet picks up the skull, and uh, that leads directly to his uh, uh, famous monologue on life and death. Uh, you can see up here. Uh, you might know that already. Uh, but perhaps you had not remembered that Shakespeare pinpointed the deleterious effect of water on the soft components of the human body, including the DNA. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for a few questions, actually. Uh, I would like you in the audience to take the chance to ask some questions, but wait for the microphone and uh, ask your questions slowly and with a loud voice, please. We have, we have a question over there. Uh, thank you for a great talk. I would like to know what happens with the B cells after somatic mutation do they have any kind of uh, repair mechanisms? 
What happens to the B cells? The B cells after, can you repeat the last thing? So, so uh, somatic permutation. Somatic permutation. Somatic mutation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to get an increased antibody repertoire, you need to have some mutations. Uh, and uh, this is perhaps the most important way you can change the specificity of an antibody, but there are other ways too, by recombining antibody genes with each other, for example. Uh, and uh, this only occurs in the segment of DNA that codes for the N-terminal section of antibodies, uh, antibody genes. Uh, what is the does, gist of your question after that? Does, does this part of the genome of the B cell, uh, do they, does, does the B cell have special repair mechanisms as any other cell? I don't think there are any special repair enzymes for B cells, uh, but uh, there are other factors coming in here that we don't quite understand yet. How do you define, how is the targeting to antibody genes uh, uh, explained when it comes to these enzymes? Why don't they act on other sites too? Huh? Uh, we don't know yet. Question over there. It seems that um, the mechanism by which the uracil is remove this multi-step process, why didn't nature invent a method to put, to put back the amino group directly on the, on the uracil? Because you can get uracil into DNA in a number of ways, uh, uh, during replication and uh, from deamination processes. Uh, and once you have taken the uracil out, uh, you have an informationless site, so you do need a mechanism where you can use the genetic information in the complementary chain to correct your error. There was, for a while, when uh, I uh, started with this DNA glycosylases and base excision repair, uh, two groups in the United States who claimed they had discovered the DNA insertase. A base had come off DNA, and there was an enzyme that just put it back again. And my immediate reaction, which turned out to be right, was that you can't do that, because you have to know which base to put in there. Huh? Uh, you don't know if you are supposed to put in uh, guanine or an adenine or something else. Huh? And that's not good enough. If I may take a second question. I mean, um, in ancient DNA, wouldn't uh, you, with the rate of, um, of change by hydrolysis, wouldn't you expect that essentially all cytosines would be deaminated? Not all of them, but it is a problem in ancient DNA research. And my good friend Svante Pebo, who has perhaps created the whole field of ancient DNA, they even used the deamination of cytosine to uracil to authenticate their material. If you don't find any deaminated cytosine at all in your DNA, it means it's not ancient. It's a contaminant from the experimenter or something like that. Uh, so there's always a small proportion of uh, uracil in uh, ancient DNA due to cytosine deamination. Now, if, you, if DNA became, let's say, a million years old, then it would all be deaminated. But there are so many other things happening in a million years that it's impossible for DNA to survive in any meaningful way. Uh, DNA has a lifetime. Uh, well, there are fragments of DNA that will survive perhaps a couple of hundred thousand years. Uh, but you can't have, uh, as claimed in the early days, DNA from dinosaurs or other organisms that are millions of uh, millions and millions of years old. Uh, that just wouldn't be any DNA that could survive. Question over here. 
maybe there's time to say a few words about your current work on uh, DNA repair in autoimmunity. That's a whole separate talk, but, uh, uh, and I'm not so sure DNA repair is the main player here, but there are small enzymes in the cells that act on DNA. We have been particularly interested in an exonuclease called uh, DNA3 or TREX1, uh, which uh, is associated with autoantibodies. So, if we make uh, knockout mice without, with, without this enzyme, uh, they survive, but they get a strong phenotype of autoimmunity, and they die from that. Any more questions? Last chance for today. Yes. Um, very simply, I was just um, interested if you feel within your lifetime or uh, some generations that uh, this can lead to medical uh, you know, help for prolonging the life of people or finding medical cures and things like that. I think the question is how does this relate to inherited disease uh, yes, you or can say DNA treatment, damage? Medical treatment in yeah. the future? Well, the first part of the question we can give an answer to. There are a number of fortunately relatively rare human diseases, inherited diseases, which are due to loss of a DNA repair enzyme. The most studied is uh, an enzyme uh, disease called xeroderma pigmentosum, which is a skin disease, and those patients are extremely susceptible to moderate doses of sunlight, and they get skin cancer, and that will kill them uh, from uh, normal exposure to sunlight. Eh? So that's uh, one example of uh, DNA repair defending us against the environment. And do you see a way that it may be, uh, you can find a way to uh, stop that process? Will there be a yeah, pharmaco pharmacological drug treatment maybe, potentially, in the future for that kind of treatment? There is already a great interest in uh, finding uh, inhibitors to DNA repair enzymes. That perhaps sounds like a counterproductive effort. But you have to remember that some of our best treatments for cancer is DNA damaging agents. Radiotherapy, for example, is still one of the best, most effective way of treating several human cancers. And a problem with radiotherapy is that the cancer cells fight back. They can repair the radiation damage and continue growing while in fact you want to hit them so that they don't survive. And if we could temporarily inactivate or uh, suppress DNA repair, uh, it's a logical conclusion that DNA uh, radiation therapy then should be much more efficient and have fewer side effects. Uh, and people take that idea seriously enough that a uh, number of people are now looking for repair inhibitors. It's not something you would take all the time, but just something you would take for a temporary period before receiving radiotherapy. I find that so interesting because most of what you're talking about is how when uh, there are DNA changes and the ones that, how they get corrected and, and now we're talking about inhibitors of that process. It's fascinating. Well, obviously, we would only inhibit DNA repair under extreme circumstances. But if you have a malignant cancer where you can predict it will kill the patients, eh? it's uh, worth improving the radiotherapy you give for that cancer. Thank you. Thank you. And by that, I would like all of you to help me to thank Professor Thomas Lindahl.